On today's episode of the CLS Experience, we have a very exclusive treat. She's a former special agent with the U.S. Secret Service, co-host of Bravo TV's competition series Spy Games, and author of the best-selling book, Becoming Bulletproof, No Big Deal. She's a multimedia journalist who regularly appears on The Today Show, NBC, MSNBC, and GMA, covering topics on national security, law enforcement, and crime, and her charisma is straight up off the charts. She holds a Master of Arts in Forensic Psychology and a Master of Science in Journalism, and she served on the Secret Service Presidential Protective Division for President Barack Obama, and she protected Presidents George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, and George H.W. Bush, just to name a few. Her Bulletproof Mindset advice is second to none, and she's here to teach you how to live life as your most confident, fearless self. She's just a juggernaut in all facets of life and a terrific human being. Please welcome the intelligent, tough, insightful, influential, and badass, the fearless Evie Pomporis. How are you doing, Evie? I should just go home. I don't need <laughs> You covered it all. Thank you so much. I'm so humbled. That was such a gracious introduction. Thank you. I did good by you. Yeah, you've crushed it. Thank you so much. I had a moment. I was like, who's he talking about? <laughs> Thank I'm you. So yeah, I'm so happy that I did good by you. Um, we probably could have chatted for an hour before we record. Um, as I was saying to you, I'm excited to connect. For my audience, my biggest suggestion, if you're not familiar with Evie, do a deep dive. Play catch up, read her book, check out her content, see all the amazing things that she has going on. What I think is most valuable today is we just have an unbelievable conversation. Before we dive in, we're going to get a little weird. You ready for me? Yeah, go. Abby, what is your superpower? Um, failure. I fail well. Please. I'm not afraid of it. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, t I'll tell you this. People people come to me and one of the things they always tell me is I'm afraid to fail. I'm afraid to this. It's always I'm afraid, I'm afraid. And when you get to it, what are you afraid of? I'm afraid of failure. And it's kind of, what does that even mean? Failing what? And, and, and there's a difference, Craig, between failing and being a failure. So if you're failing at something, it means you're trying and you're trying to pivot and figure it out. You're being a failure is finite. It means it's over, game over. And the only time it's game over, it's when it's legitimately game over. And I think people mix the two. When I am failing, I am doing. It means I am doing in life. Life is not doing to me. I am doing to life. I have no problem with failure. I like it because it makes me resilient. It's allowed me to bounce back. It doesn't allow things to be so crushing because when you spend your life avoiding it and avoid making choices so that you don't fail because you think it's stressful and it's bad, the amount of chronic stress and pain and anguish that you accumulate, there, there, there is no equivalent. Failure is quick, it's brief, it's a moment, and it passes. So I think for me, I have failed, I have failed well, and I have failed in so many things. And because of that, I have been successful in so many things. I don't see it and worry. I fail forward. What do I got? And it's it's not a finite thing. And I think that's what people worry about. And also, you have to have this element within you. So what? So what? We're so concerned sometimes with the exterior appearance of what it looks like. And I don't subscribe to that. It is limiting, it is damaging, and it's soul crushing. I'm just laughing because I, I just love you. And we just started um, and I couldn't agree more. And wow, I, I think that most people are so afraid to fail or look silly that they don't even get started in the first place. Right. And one of the core messages that I love to speak about, and it's a topic of our book coming out in August, is reinvention. And I think that most people feel as though they're here for something more than they're currently doing. But I also think that most people are paralyzed to get started because of the very fear of failure. But I have a similar mind to, to you in just the sense that my, con my thought process is if I'm not failing, then I'm not trying. Right. Because Everybody was first a beginner at something, Disney, Steve Jobs, whoever, but you have to get in the damn arena 
and, and not be afraid at what happens. The end is not attached to the outcome. And every single time you, and I'm putting in quotations, fail, you learn. And, and that makes you more battle-tested and seasoned to improve on, on whatever you do next, right? If you don't fail in life, you will live a life of regret because it means you're not doing. Failure equals doing. You know, I, because of the background that I came from and because I was in a, a job that was a very life or death job, right? So any day I went to work, it could be um, my last day. And that really, in and of itself, that was a blessing, because it allowed me to think of my life as if it would end the next day. And when you see life in that way, you fear nothing. You don't fear the failure. You, it, and because I live with that mindset, it allowed me to live to my fullest. So it's interesting. I had, you know, my first um, life or death situation was truly was September 11th. And that was the first point in my life where I, I thought, this is it, you know, this is my end. And I remember feeling, you know, I remember sitting at, by the, at the ground zero as the first tower was coming down and I was, uh, I'd found like this crevice to kind of hide and to hopefully survive the collapse of the tower. And I remember as it was coming down, I, I was thinking, oh, I'm done, this is it, this is my end. And I had this, this sadness, kind of this wave come over and there was, it was twofold. One sadness, one part of it was I was alone. And I remember thinking, man, I'm gonna die alone. I'm going to die alone. And are they going to find me when this thing is over? And then the second part of that wave of sadness was, I didn't live. I haven't lived yet. I haven't done yet. I can't go yet. I felt unfinished. And I've taken that with me since that day. And I said, you know what? I don't know what's going to come. And especially with the job that I had, you know, any day could be, you know, when you're in that line of work, any day could be your your last night. And I promised myself, I said, I when the next time comes for me for that to happen, because it will, it has comes for all of us. I'm going to leave be with the feeling of I did. I did everything I wanted to do. And if I didn't get there yet, I was in the process of trying to get there. That is how I've lived. And I think that is where the fear of failure evaporates. And that's when you you are truly in tune with your soul and doing the things that, as you said, which you're, you're being pulled and you have to listen to that pull. I'm, look, I'm huge on mindset. Mindset's powerful, the discipline, the mind and all that. But at the same time, I understand that there's a balance and the other balance is your soul, your essence, your spirit, label it however you want. It pulls you in a direction and you must follow it. You have to let it lead you. And that's a personal choice. And it's not something we go around and we ask everybody else for their opinion on. It is something we must intuitively connect with and trust. And that's where trust within ourselves comes. If you don't trust yourself, forget it. Just fold those cards and walk away. You couldn't pay me a billion to be anywhere else right now, straight up. Uh, I'm so engaged in this conversation. And two things that come to mind is, I think the word scarcity, most people think it's a negative because it's like the opposite of abundance. But the way you were living based upon your profession at that time was like every day could be your last. So you treat every moment like this could be your last. So you're super mindful and present in that moment. And I think that's a good paradigm shift to treat life like that. Like, God willing, people have parents, like call them. Like you don't know when the last phone call that you can make is with your kid, whatever the case may be. But the other thing, I just got really emotional and that never really happens. When you were telling the story, when I made my major shift, people asked me all the time, like, weren't you scared? Like you had a business on Wall Street. You had no thing going on with social media or net or connection or anything like that. I was, I did this eulogy exercise where, and I learned this in NLP back in the day when I first started studying personal development. We're like, if this was it for me in two weeks, who would be at my funeral and what would honestly be said? And, and I was really honest with myself and like, yeah, I had some okay relationships, but that I leave a legacy that I really make an impact. No. And, and that scared the shit out of me. And that's why I really just leaned into this, burned the ship, so to speak, and went all in because I felt the same. And I can honestly say, although we're just getting warmed up and there's so much more to do 
over the last two years, I probably lived more than the previous 35 combined, but I can honestly say for the first time in my life, I gave this thing everything I got, or like you said, or I'm working on the things that, that haven't come yet. And I think that's such a good exercise and so powerful for everybody to take a second listening and really ask yourself, did you really live or were you kind of starring in a movie called Existing, which I was for a very long time? I love that. I, I have this term actually, own your existence. Own it. Oof. Own it. Own your existence. Are you owning it? Or are you just, or is everybody else owning you? Yeah. I, own I, your life. Yeah. Who's in charge? Yeah. yeah. It, it's so crazy because I was so invested in this story, Evie, that this was it for me. I was a Wall Street guy. I never really find love. And like, this is it for me. And then in the lockdown pandemic, I realized, wait a minute, can I choose a different story? Can I play a different movie? And then instead of thinking about like, what can go wrong? I started thinking, about, well, what can go right? And, and I started thinking about, well, what else? What else is possible? And I think everybody, well, I don't think I know, everybody has a choice once you become mindful and aware that you can buy into any story and, and then you can own your existence. Yes, but I'm going to be, honest, not everybody does that. And not any everybody wants to do that. There are people I come across who say, Evie, I want to change. I want to this. And you'll say, okay, you know, how about this? How about that? And then it's always interesting because there's two types of personas that I come across. It's people who are like, yes, I will do. I, I'm going to change. I'm going to shift. And they do it. And then there's those when you, when you speak with them and you, you, you see like, well, how about shifting this and this and everything's, uh, no, I can't because of this. Oh, well, no, if I do this because of that, I, well, I can't shift this. And it's not everybody has that in them. And I, it's such a powerful thing where you have to look inwards and say, do I have it in me? And am I going to do it? Yeah. And not everybody makes that choice. And then we surrender to what we think is. And then we live angry. We live bitter. We live pissed. We live sad. We live depressed. We live completely self-absorbed. And then we're lost. There's nothing worse than being lost. I can confirm. Because I have contrast. Yeah. This is so good. You have quite the resume. You've done so many cool, exciting things. But yet you're, you're so young in the grand schemes of things. You're just getting warmed up. I'm just curious, straight off the cuff. What are you most excited about right now, personally? I'm excited because, wow, I think I'm excited that I do a lot of different things, work. Like I've crushed, everything has been career, work, work, work. Uh, I wanted to go to the NYPD. I jumped in. I did it. Uh, I wanted Secret Service. I moved. I did it. And then, you know, it's interesting because as you were telling your story to me earlier about how you transitioned, I went through all that to get in the U.S. Secret Service. I get in. I'm stable. I get to the president's detail. I'm 13 years in. And then I had a moment. I'm like, I think I can do more. And so people would look at me, you're going to do more. You're going to do something different. I was like, yeah, I really want to. And then I transitioned um, out of what I was doing into TV, into media, journalism. And I began doing the news and covering national security stuff. And then from that, working on TV shows and just aligning myself with like big, like amazing projects, things I never thought or I could have ever conceived of doing. And so I've always pursued the, those things and done that. But I think, and not to get like, I'm going to draw on to like the more the personal side. I get to be my mom this year too. Wow. And thank you. And, and there's something extraordinary about that. I was such a career business person, just work person. And I realized like, what a gift it is to give somebody else life. Um, and then there's there's just kind of like a whole learning curve here of, you know, raising my daughter in guiding her, but not, she's my daughter, but she's not mine. And 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 now I'm in this other space where I, how do I allow this this human being to grow and be herself, but not tell her who to be and how to do it. And finding that balance of, I can nurture the soil and fertilize and all that, but then she has to decide how she's going to grow. And so this is a kind of a, a new journey for me to, to do this. And 
for me, I think you can't do everything all at once. I, I, I hear sometimes people say, well, how do you balance it all? So here's the secret. You can't. Not in the same moment. So you can have a life, a full life that is balanced from beginning to end, because, but you can't have it all simultaneously. So it's, if work's going to take the front and sometimes personal life takes the back. If this career is going to take the front, then sometimes a relationship will take take a little bit of a back seat. It's kind of a peak an up down thing. And I, I learned to let it be and not to put so much stress on myself that it has to be perfect because it doesn't. Life is messy, but you have to be able to flow with the mess. And if you can flow with the mess and pivot and clean it up, then you're living. If you're trying to make it too polished and perfect, which it will never be, you will never launch. You will never go because you can never get it to that pristine place. Right. So I think I'm learning to, to access just a different part of myself and still try to do my, my work stuff, which I love. And then at the same time, be a soulful grounded human being so that I can raise another soulful grounded human being. Yeah. That was so beautiful. Uh, thank you for sharing that and pulling back the garden and being so vulnerable. I can't wait to be a dad, God willing, in the not too distant future. Um, but but I love what you said there, right? And like, you might have this idea in your head about how your kid's supposed to be, but it, that's not really how the world works, right? Like you can guide them and, and help them navigate based upon your experience of work, but they also have to be who they are, right? And, and experience that stuff. And, and you have to let them do that and, and embrace that. And I was speaking to someone recently who like specializes in this type of stuff. Um, probably not her, Dr. Shafali. And, and she was told me like she had this whole idea of wh who her kid was supposed to be. And then it was nothing like that. And she almost had a little resentment. And then she had to realize, no, this is my kid. And they're a little bit different than I visualized, but perfect in their own way, so to speak. And all you can do is got, plant the, the soil, right? Or the seeds or the case may be, but you gotta be, you gotta let them kind of sprout or, or do their thing so to speak yeah I mean I and I, you know like my family they did their best but they 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 everything I did was very unorthodox Every, everything was very wild and why are you making these choices and these aren't normal decisions which they weren't and um but this is where I I followed my I guess my myself my soul that pull that you feel. And I think that that's where people sometimes get confused between the voice in the head and the maybe the the voice in their their soul. It's when you feel this pull, you have to go where the pull is because yes. it's something telling you that there's something else out there. And, and you, you have to connect and listen to it. But what we do is we will dialogue with it in our head. And if I dialogue something in my head, I can always conv convince myself not to do it. Same. You can always find a, a way to do it. And, you know, think about taking taking working out because you were bringing out uh, working out, do, running a marathon, right? You can dialogue it to yourself not to do it. In fact, ma marathon comes from the Greek word marathonas. And he was the, it was a, during a time of war, he ran to tell uh, the Athenians that, that we had won the war in Greece. And when he ran the, the 26 miles, he actually <laughs> delivered the message and died. Um, and so it became a historic thing where, you know, run the marathon. But you can talk yourself out of doing anything. But it's, you also have to know when to not listen to that voice in your head. Yeah, same. And, and you nailed it, right? And for someone that's like rational, so to speak, or practical, you always want to figure, like make, make things make sense. But I only recently started more allowing and being, and the intuition or that whisper, it's never going to like shout at you. It's going to be like a little bit whisper but you have to turn the volume up. And when it's pulling you the way you described it, like that's what you have to lean into. And for the first time in my life, I really did that. And my life was never the same. And I encourage everybody listening um, that when you feel that pull, it's it's separate from the voice in your head. And I would, I would suggest that you try it out and see where it leads you and be open to it. Yeah. And, you know, you brought up earlier, you said something about being afraid, you know, when people said to you, aren't you afraid? Aren't you afraid? And I think people get confused. It's like, yes, you can be afraid, but still do. You can be afraid and still move. 
Mm. You know, when I was, you know, in the service and the idea was, the idea was you, you, we did security and we did protection. The majority of the way you protect someone is proactive. It's all the stuff you do behind the scenes in advance that nobody sees. There really truly is protection, 80, 90% of it. But that small window, about 10% to 15%, the physical security, which is the actual jumping in front of a bullet, taking a bullet for someone, there, there's no, make no mistake, there's fear in doing that, but you don't live in that fear. It's yes, you're supposed to feel fear. You're supposed to uh, understand it and you use it to make rational, you use it to make decisions in life. But when fear is in the driver's seat of your car, that's where the problem is. Fear can be the passenger seat every once in a while saying, hey, watch out, red light, whoa, slow down. You know, we're going a little bit too fast or hey, stop sign, let's pause here. But fear can't be the driver. Yeah. But it's when we pass it, the wheel over, we say, you drive, I'll just sit in the passenger seat. And that goes back to, well, I'm not owning my existence. Yeah. This couldn't be better, straight up. Um, and I feel fear when I'm going to do something really big, right? Like we're launching our first book and it just became available for pre-sales today, actually. And even Amazing. The- Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you so much. And even like the marathons, like I ran six, but I, I did another half on Sunday. Like I feel a little anxious beforehand. Doesn't mean I'm not going to do it. She's like, I respect the task at hand, right? So it's like you said, like keep them in the passenger seat. Thank you. I see you, but you have a choice if, if you're going to let that paralyze you or acknowledge it, but then power through. And the irony is, is based on my experience, I'd love to hear if you agree. When you do feel that and you take that uncomfortable or messy action anyway, usually all the, the biggest growth is on the other side of that. Would you agree? Yes. And I love that you said that you had anxiety before the run because people, the, the and it's not people's fault because they're being sold this, that you need to feel perfect to do these things. And all the stars and everything has to be perfectly aligned for you to do something so that you don't feel anxious or fear fearful to do something. And it's nonsense. Or I'll have people come to me and say, I'm not motivated. I'm not motivated. And I'll say motivated to do what? I'm not motivated to start a business or to go do here and go do that. And I said, what do you need motivation for? The most amazing things I've done in my life, I've had anxiety, worry, fear, stress, zero motivation. If I waited, if you take something as simple as working out, let's take something as simple as working out. If I waited, Greg, to be motivated to go work out, you know what? I would never go. Never. <laughs> I come up with a thousand and one reasons why I should not go. When I went to the U.S. Secret Service Academy, even NYPD Academy, that was my first academy, I was stressed out. I was anxious. I didn't know what I was doing. I was getting yelled at every day. I was like, uh, um, I, I, every any day I was going in. I'm like, they're gonna, I'm gonna, they're gonna disqualify me. I'm gonna get kicked out. I can't keep up. I can't this. My anxiety was through the roof. I stuck it out. And I think it's important to tell people the truth and to for people to not be looking for this bliss, for this motivation, for this kumbaya feeling of everything coming into harmony so that you can do. You must do it when you feel the anxiety. You must move forward when you feel the stress. You will never do. And I have the say, saying, motivation equals mediocrity. Because if you wait to be motivated, to be inspired, to not feel anxious, to not feel stressed, to do things in life, you will do nothing. Because even if you get that motivation, if, if you're lucky enough to get that feeling, it comes, it hangs out for a little bit, and then it's out, it's gone. And you're like, where did it go? And this is why people don't finish what they start. Wait, 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 I need motivation. So instead of you pursuing what you need to do, you're chasing this imaginary thing called motivation, or you're chasing this imaginary thing of, I need to feel bliss and perfection and be perfectly healed in life. And I have to have, I have to be in the state of bliss to do. If anybody can get there, please let me know. I would love to join you because I don't know a single person who is in this, this state of this place of perfection. It doesn't exist. And we sell this, people are being sold this stuff and nobody does because they're like, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. Newsflash, you won't ever be there. Never. And I imagine like something as big and significant as important as having a kid, right? Or reinventing yourself or whatever. Like it's never the perfect time, right? You you take that messy action so be, and you figure things out. Like you said earlier in the conversation, be willing to pivot and, and navigate and call audible, so to speak. 
Yes. So, so we're talking about is adaptability, which is a huge thing. Yes. And I think those, those that comes with one other thing first, accept and adapt. So I think accepting is, and, I, and it seems like it's what you did, Craig, when you looked at your life and you said, you accepted the truth of where you were. And you said, this isn't it. Sometimes we don't accept the truth of what is, and we'll sell it to ourselves as if it's okay. And it's not. So acceptance is being honest with ourselves and saying, this thing that I created or I designed or my situation, what is the reality? And accepting the reality, when we can live in truth, then we can create a plan and pivot. But when we live in falsehood, and falsehood can be either we make things really, really negative, or we make things super positive when they're really not. And it's living in the truth and in the reality of what is, and then saying, okay, here's the truth. Now, how do I pivot? Nothing turns out the way we want it to turn out. But the hardest thing I think for folks is to accept. What is my, what is the reality? Not my truth, because my truth is subjective. The truth, the reality of life, where you are. And saying, okay, maybe I'm not where I want to be. Or maybe I made some wrong choices. Or maybe I thought I was going this way and life pushed me this way. I accept it. I'm okay with it. I own it. Now, where do I go from here? And then you you pivot, you adapt. And I always, there's this saying that Bruce Lee had, which was, be water, my friend. And I always tell people, be water. Don't be so rigid. When you're a rock, when you're this solid thing, like nothing can get around you. You can't bend, you can't flow, you can't do. Water's amazing. Water takes the shape of whatever it goes into. And water's slow. It's not an a quick fix it erodes and it, it it molds things over time and i think that's also important because we're in a, a space where people think it has to happen it has to happen it has to happen and things take time energy and effort and just because something doesn't happen in six months doesn't mean you stop you're not failing you just you're getting there yeah could i love you anymore i mean could you be on any more fire this is awesome and the biggest realization that i had when I finally took a moment to reassess was acceptance that I was not where I'd hoped I'd be at this time. And just to be clear, acceptance doesn't mean approval, right? But you have to accept so you can now take inspired action. And I accepted the fact that I was underachieving big time. I wasn't happy. I wasn't fulfilled. Uh, and I should probably be doing something else with my life. And the moment that I had that realization, now it's like I forgave myself right? For being where I was at. And now I can shift my energy. Okay, so what do I want to do next? And by accepting that I wasn't where I'd like to be for the first time, it was like this big breakthrough for me that I can now start pivoting and changing my situation or fulfilling my assignment or while I'm here. And I never really thought about it like this, but you just articulated so beautifully. You have to accept doesn't mean you have to like it, right? But in order to change it, you have to accept it so you could then make moves, so to speak. Well, I like what you said. It, acceptance doesn't mean I approve. Yeah. Acceptance means I see things and I accept the truth. I may not like it, but I accept it. And and that's a really important thing because if you don't see what is, then how can you put a plan in place to shift and change? Because the plan you're building is then a fake plan. It's a false plan. It's It's built on mythology. It's not built on truth. It doesn't mean approval. And it doesn't mean it's not a negative thing. I think we when we people think like if if when we accept something that's negative, it it doesn't have to be negative, is what I'm trying to say. We put that spin on it because society tells us these things are bad and we don't forgive ourselves. And then instead of moving forward, you know, we don't, we don't bounce back. Resilience, which is a term that I hear a lot, you know, people like, I want to be resilient. Well, resilience is your ability to bounce back. And the more you deal with difficulties, the better and more efficient and quicker you will bounce back. So instead of spending your life avoiding conflict, avoiding fear, avoiding things that challenge you, um, of trying to create this cocooned environment 
when you are faced with conf conflict, you're gonna you're gonna flail. You're gonna you're gonna drown. But when you are resilient, resilience is my ability to deal with the problem, and then recover from that problem quickly and efficiently, putting a plan in place. You embrace failure. You em embrace these different things. The better you're gonna be at recovering, and then at the same time, it's not gonna be soul crushing. Whereas people will experience something and it it devastates them. And it can be, and I've, see, I've seen it, Craig, I've seen it from just career to relationships to divorce. I've seen people get divorced and it takes them years to recover. And they'll come to me, you know, because I work some, with clients and I have mentees. They'll come to me and I tell them that there's a point where do you want to move on or do you want to stay here and keep feeling this? Because you can stay here and you can bathe in this sorrow. But there's also on you that you are choosing to stay here in this place. Yeah. Can, how can you, if it's, it's like, I always tell people, it, you come to me and you're like, have you bought this brand new Maserati? I want to drive this thing really, really fast, but it won't go past 50. What's the problem? Well, the problem is, yeah, I know you bought this brand new Maserati, but you've got this big ass U-Haul attached to it in the back. <laughs> it's got all your baggage and your drama and your trauma. How, and you're telling me, why am I not going fast? That's why you got to unhinge it and leave that stuff there. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. It doesn't mean it wasn't painful. It doesn't mean it wasn't difficult. But what you're doing is instead of looking at it as an, as an experience in life, a bad experience or traumatic experience or whatever it is, but instead of looking at it as a moment in my life or a period of time in my life, what we tend to do is some folks take it and they make it their identity. It's me. This is who I am now. And I'm going to take this with me everywhere I go. And then we wonder, why can't I drive the Maserati fast? You can't because you're taking all that stuff with you. And part of it is forgiving yourself, forgiving your choices, forgiving others. And even with forgiving others, you don't have to go to somebody who's harmed you and say, I forgive you. No need. But you can release it. You can put that forgiveness out there because you need to move forward and you can't move forward forward when you're bitter and you're angry and you're depressed and you're sad. And all you're doing is reliving all the negative things in your life. Or maybe I underachieved, or maybe I studied the wrong thing in school, or maybe I took the wrong job, or maybe I picked the wrong person. You have to surrender to that stuff because this is part of the experience of life. And you're not owning your existence. You're being owned by it when you just, when you live in this, when you live in this sadness. This is so good, so deep, so relatable. I lived in that place for so long. I wouldn't change a thing because I think everything happened the way it was supposed to so that we can do what we're doing now and so forth. But but I agree with everything that you're saying. I There's mean, nothing wrong with it, Craig, you know? No. What's wrong with it? Yeah. I, I would just say to people, if you've been through some shit, which, spoiler alert, everybody has or is going through that in some capacity, give yourself a little grace and, and don't sit there and dwell on it. Focus on what you learn and, and what could you do next? And then, like you said, you're talking about resilience. The best way to become more battle tested, right? Or bulletproof, no pun intended, is to continuously do hard things. And, and then you become more resilient. And then the setbacks aren't catastrophes. They're just, you know, a, a, a small setback to spring you forward. Yes. If you're not used to dealing with problems, everything's catastrophic. Everything's yeah. the end of the world. Yeah. Oh, and in some ways, when I went to the NYPD, and especially in the U.S. Secret Service, it was understood things were not going to go to plan. So if we did a, a protection assignment, right, we're protecting the president. We had a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, a plan D. We were always prepared to pivot, always. We never went in with the mindset, this is perfect. This is going to go as planned. It never did. Sometimes we had big pivots. Sometimes we had small ones. But we had the ability to accept, hey, there's going to be a problem. And then, but we didn't have the luxury to sit and dwell on that problem because you had to move, you had to go. If you delayed, somebody might die, you might die, your colleagues might die, the person you're protecting might die. You had to go, you had to flow with it. You didn't have time to sit there and dwell and think, oh my God, I made the wrong choice. Oh my goodness, this happened. You, you have to get to the next and the next. And I love what you said that you said everybody's going through it. And I think people need to remember that. In fact, there was a research study I was reading about, and it said 70% of people have either been through something traumatic or tragic in their lives. 70%. It's high. It's a very high number. And so I, 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 I say this, and I say this with all the warmth in my heart. 
you're not that special. <laughs> and I think sometimes when we think, oh, no, no, this is, this is just happening. I'm that special that this is just happening to me. And I tell people, I release you. You're not. Know that everybody's out there swimming in this soup, trying to figure it out. And so when we know that, if anything, that lightens the load and the sadness and the grief of saying, why is this happening to me? It's like, hold on, it, put your helmet on because it's gonna, it happens to others. And you know what? It may happen to you again because part of our journey is coming into contact with people, sometimes problematic people and navigating those relationships, toxicity as what you said, toxic relationships, learning how to navigate those. And then even circumstances or situations. So here's the thing, even if you get past this one thing, no, life is like, it's like a revolving door. You're going through that door. And so something else is gonna happen. And then later on something else, and then later on something else. If you're waiting for this perfection of bliss, you're not living, you're just, you're truly then living in fear because you're living in fear and your, your, your navigation or your compass is, I need to avoid all problems. I don't know how you're going to do that. No, unless it's you're not, not living. Yeah, unless you're not really living. That's the only no, way. And, even, and even Craig working in the White House, if you just take away, you know, just my observance of being around presidents, uh, even them, and regardless of who, this is, uh, it has nothing to do with politics or anything like that. If somebody is a president of the United States, that's not a small thing to accomplish. That's not an easy feat to get into that office. But in watching those individuals do that, they didn't. They did. They weren't fear based. They went in there and they knew that they were going to get abused. They were going to get ripped up apart. They're going to get shredded. But they did it anyway. And resiliency. I've never seen resilience like that because when you're going through something hard, and then there, you're on. Uh, you know, CNN or Fox or whatever news, and they're just abusing you. Abusing. And you right? you can't sit there and be in the fetal fetal position and cry about it and say, oh my God, look at all the horrible things they're saying about me. You got to go. Yeah. People are relying on you. Yeah. I think we got to pull ourselves out of the muck and own that we can either sit there in this like debasement or we can own our existence and say, I... I'm going to change this. And a lot of that too comes down to discipline as well, self-discipline. Much more important than motivation. I don't believe in motivation. I, I don't look for it. I don't waste my time with it. Zero. Zero. Absolute zero. Uh, it's, it's a complete waste of time. I take my energy and my focus on doing and then discipline. It's like, hey, get up, go move. And even with... Uh, in talking to myself, like if we take like exa the example of working out or doing things, I I just go. I I can talk myself out of the difficult stuff if I let myself do that. But discipline is saying I'm going to do this and I'm dedicated to it. But even discipline too, Craig comes even to the simple things as the thoughts that you think, or the people you let into your life, or how much you absorb. Sometimes I'll have folks tell me, "Oh, I'm so empathic. I just absorb everybody." It's not my fault. Yes, it is. Stop absorbing everybody. Sure. You have to know when to shield and protect yourself. Yeah. Again, you just can't be the recipient of what the world does to you. You go out there and you do to the world. You impact the world. That's really beautiful. And that's something I'm working on too. Um, it is not absorbing so much energy and so forth. And my fiance, so she's a little bit more of a savage. So she's a really good balance. And to be honest with you, you remind me of her a lot. Were you born in Greece? I was born here in the U.S. Where? Well, my parents were, were, I was born in Harlem. Oh, wow. Okay. I know because I was doing my homework because number one, I'm a fan. And number two, I wanted to show this conversation the respect it deserves. Your dad was born there and then he came over and, and he had a little bit of trouble get going with his accent and so forth, correct? My dad, and this was one of the hardest things to watch. First of all, my dad was very dark, dark skin, dark eyes, dark um, mm -hmm. He looked straight up Middle East, Middle Eastern. In fact, we would, you know, my brother and I, when we would travel, like he would be the person that they would pull off the 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 line and say, sir, we need to talk to you and inspect your bags. <laughs> so my brother and I'd be like, you go with him this time or you go with them. Um, but he dealt with a lot of difficulties. He came to America. His accent was very heavy. He couldn't find work. And, you know, I think back, it was very hard watching it because people would talk to him like he was stupid because he had an accent. And, you know, this was a very hardworking man. He was in the Merchant Marines in the Greek Navy, and he was a captain. And, you know, he came to America, he came for work. And 
to go from that to like being talked to like you're you're dumb. In fact, you know, there were times where he would even have me call like the 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 electrical company or the phone company because he just didn't want to talk to them because they would just talk to him like he was just dumb. And I for me watching my parents it was hard. It was hard to watch my parents go through that. And, and sometimes, you know, I remember, I've never shared this story. I remember once I was uh, out late at night and actually I was still in the service. I, I got in very young. And so at the time, even though I was secret service, I lived at home and I was out doing an assignment and I came back and I remember there's all these fire trucks in front of our house, our home. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, what's going on here? And I, I pull up and then my car wasn't like a, an undercover car. So it, it looked like a regular car. I come out and I see the fire department and all these trucks. And I say to the fireman, I'm like, hey, what's going on here? And they're all hanging out in front of my house. And they're, they're laughing. And they're like, oh, some, some guy in there, this old dude, he called us because it was really windy. It was like a storm. And he thinks this tree is going to fall in his house. We can't even understand him. And they start abusing my dad to me. Now, I, I didn't look anything like him. I remember watching this thinking, they're talking about my father. You know, and I remember going there to the side and I say the story and it's, it hurts. hurts me. And I'm like, Dad, I was like, dad, is, is everything okay? He's like, I'm trying to tell them like this, look at this tree and you could see the tree, the neighbor's tree. He's like, it's going to fall in the house. He's like, I don't know what to do. He's like, they're not listening to me. And I'm a little ashamed too, Craig, because I never went back there to say to them, hey, why are you making fun of him? That's my dad. I never did that. And to this day, I wish I had done that. So I think just going back to your initial question is, you know, we all, I guess we, we all go through different things and we all experience different things. And our parents, you know, my parents experienced, they were very just, they were laborers. They didn't have a lot and they really, to some degree, got a lot of they face a lot of hardship and and uh, what here in, as immigrants, although I love this country very much and I, the opportunities I have in this country, I have them because I was born here. But at the same time, you know, they there was a struggle there. And I think it's everybody struggles. And I think, too, they would put their fears from me about the choices I made in life. They would project their fears onto me. Don't do this. Don't do that because they spent, they had, they were, they were the recipients of so much hurt. I understand. Thank you for sharing that. And I asked you about that because it reminds me of my fiance. She's from Ukraine and her parents were born there. She came in when she was 14. Um, but her dad also a very proud man. And, and just as you were describing it, I couldn't help but think about him, but he, you know, he speaks with a thick accent and oftentimes like on the phone, like he gets frustrated. And so my fiance will take over and so forth. Um, but you just made me feel some type of way. Um, and I hear you and thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. And I imagine that's one of the reasons why you are where you are. And like, you have a, like a little bit of a chip on your shoulder and you will not be treated like that. You know what I think is, you can sit and let just people abuse you, or you could say, I'm not. And and sometimes it's not about getting in people's faces. Sometimes once in a while it is, I am from Queens and sometimes people need to be, <laughs> <laughs> you should not be afraid to check people every once in a while. We're not checking everybody. Cause if we are, that means we got an ego problem. Right. Okay. Uh, so the, my majority of the rule is when you come across toxic people situations, just get out, bow out, leave, pick up your toys, pick up your shit, go play somewhere else. But from time to time, things should be addressed and it's okay to address things yeah. and you should. And what's interesting is based on my experience, because I started doing that more as of late, but you do it in a way, right? Like you deliver it with, you know, very assertive, but also it makes sense what you're saying. Based on my experience so far, people tend to respect that and, and kind of bow down a little bit because you stood up for yourself, but also you said it because it needed to be addressed as opposed to just turning the other cheek. So obviously you have to be selective. Like you said, if it's a toxic person, it's probably not worth your energy, but every now and then stand up for yourself. You know, it's interesting. You deal with people incrementally. First, you teach people, or excuse me, you show people how to treat you. 
So if people are rolling you all the time, you have to pause and ask yourself, what am I doing that has made this person think it's okay to keep rolling me? And sometimes in our efforts, efforts to avoid conflict, we go so far and we do it little by little by little to the point where we're like, how am I... How is this happening to me? How is this person rolling me all the time or treating me like this all the time? We have to acknowledge that we groom people to treat us a certain way. Now, I will say this, you know, because I my background is in human behavior. When I was in the U.S. Secret Service, I did interviews and interrogations. And then from that, even now today, I do consulting and I work with people. And one of the big things is people come to me with, I have this problem with this person. I'm trying to work with this person or I have a, this issue with someone. I agree with you when you have someone that is toxic to you, because there are people who are get along fine with others, but with you, it's not working. So you have to look at how people are toward you, their behavior toward you, not towards others, toward you. When you can avoid or pull back, do it. Now there's strategic ways to do it because sometimes we can't do it. Sometimes we can't cut people out of our lives. And I always tell people, don't cut people out, let them go. There's a difference. When you cut somebody out, it comes from a place of anger, of spite, it's not a good feeling but when you let people go it's almost like i'm letting you go i'm not sending you any negativity bad vibes i'm just letting you go because you're not for me and that's okay when you can do that that's great there are times we can't sometimes it's a family member and we can love a family member but maybe not like them and so maybe we're, we're like I, I can't completely cut this person out it's a painful thing but i i i need to lessen my the access this person has to me or answer the phone when I'm okay to talk to them or create more space between myself and this person. And there's also ways to address people. And and I, I will say this too, because this comes up a lot. Everyone tell you, when people come to me, one of the issues they have is I tell people my boundaries. I tell them my boundaries. They keep crossing my boundaries. I keep telling them nobody listens. And I say to them, why are you telling them? Nobody cares. No one's listening. And you're not enforcing them. Stop telling people your boundaries. You show people your boundaries. You don't say to someone, hey, for example, don't call me past eight o'clock. You know what you do? You don't answer the phone when they call past eight o'clock. Guess what? They're going to stop calling. We have to show and that assertiveness and strength has to come from within. And we have to, you're going to make mistakes and it's okay. But we have to find that within and make those choices on our own. But there is, I agree with you, there's a way to talk to people. Because when you're too in people's faces, it doesn't typically work. Right. Even if you're right, people are going to push back, they get defensive. It doesn't land on them well. So yeah. I want you to think of when you address someone, unless you want to check them, because every once in a while you're like, oh, no, no, I need to tell you. But for the most part, the way to do it, and there's a great a quote from Winston Churchill and my secret, one of my supervisors on the president's detail taught me this. And he said, a diplomat is someone who can tell you to go to hell and make you look forward to the trip. That's who I need you to be. That's what he said to me. And I was just like, oh, shit. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So many nuggets here. This is crazy because I had so many things that I wanted to talk about in this conversation, but... This was like the least scripted conversation I ever had. It, it was just so off the cuff and natural. And I think this is what makes the best conversations. There is something I definitely wanted to ask you that we'll land the plane with. One thing that you say that really hit home for me is that you are the gatekeeper of the stress you let in your life. And I think that's correlated to what you were just speaking about, but maybe not. And I'd selfishly love to know, can you tell us what you mean by that? Yeah. So you're from New York. Yes, Craig? Yes. Did you grow up here? Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you go to the bars and the clubs in New York, because I, I can only assess to New York City because I never really partied anywhere else. When growing up, you go to the front door, right, of the bar club, and what? There's a bouncer there, and you show up with your friends or whoever, and you're waiting to see if they're going to let you in, right? Yeah. It, there's either the, they get the person to come to the door to decide whether they're going to let you in. They don't let everybody in. Yeah. They pick and choose who they let in. Mm -hmm. And if they decide to let you in, they pick up the velvet rope. They say, come on in. And then if for whatever reason you do something that they don't like, they go in and they say, hey, sir, you need to go. And they throw, they ask you to leave. That's what that means. You got to be the bouncer of your life. So if you have nobody at the front door, there's no bouncer. 
there's no person with a VIP checklist and you just let everybody in and they just mess everything up. They fuck up your whole life. That's on you. Because you let them all in. Instead of choosing, who do I let in? And for how long are they going to stay? But if they're coming in and you let them into your home and they mess everything up, you let them in. You have to be thoughtful about who you let in. Who should have access to you and why? And how much access? And how much access? You don't have to give everybody everything. And I think sometimes, often people come across it and they'll try to find one person and make this one person perfect for everything. Well, they're great here, but they're not great there. And that, that goes back to acceptance. You're not accepting and allowing someone to just be what they are. And maybe this person can only give you this sliver of stuff. And then you go to somebody else. We, we put too much expectations on other people to be this perfect thing we need them to be instead of looking at people individually and saying I will go to this person for business advice because they're very good here but they're not really probably the best person to go to for personal guidance or I'll go to this person for emotional support but they're the last person I should be asking about you know making a a non-fear-based decision this is where you have to have thoughtfulness of who you're going to and I I I, I always before I talk to someone, ask somebody for advice, or if somebody's going to give it to me, there's two questions I always say to myself, who is this person? Why should I listen to them? And even I teach as an adjunct professor for the City University of New York. I teach criminal justice criminology. Every day, first day of class, I get up there. And before I even get into the syllabus and talk to my students, I tell them, you have a semester with me. And every Saturday morning, for the, we're going to spend the first three hours together. You're going to sit and listen to me, and I'm going to teach you. I have to tell you who you are and why you should listen to me. If I expect you to sit Saturday after Saturday morning to sit and listen to me preach for three hours, well, you should know why. Who am I and why should you listen to me? Where does my area of expertise come from? Where does my experience come from? That is how you should look at people instead of looking at people and saying like, oh, you come on in and stay as long as you like. Access is key and you have to be the bouncer and gatekeeper of who has access to you how much access they have to you and for how long they stay. And the choice is ours and nobody is exempt from how much we allow. Or yeah. not. It, it's, it's a personal choice. It's personal choice and it can range. Usually most of the time when people come to me, when I work with people, it, you know, it's interesting. It's almost always family. Family is the hardest thing for folks. I can relate. Family is hard. People struggle with that one the most. How do you personally navigate with that and land the plane with that? It depends. So I've seen, as a criminal, I worked criminal investigations in the U.S. Secret Service. And I will tell you that I worked cases um, related to, to children. And I've seen like excessive cr cruelty, neglect, abuse, sexual abuse. So I want to preface seeing, saying that that stuff exists, that stuff is real, and that stuff is dangerous. Um, now, if we're going to difficult parenting, it's different for everybody, and it's a personal choice. I, I will say I love my parents, but they grew up in a village, and they didn't know how to raise me. They did the best that they could. I got beat downs like really? forever. Oh, yeah. But that's how my dad was raised. He didn't know. Plus the stress of being in a whole other country, plus this, plus that. Now, when I was younger, it was harder for me. But then as I got older, I could see things a little differently. And then I appreciated him for who he was. But at the same time, I knew what his limitations were. So, but that was my personal choice. I was okay with it. So it's like, you can forgive people and say, and look at it and say, okay, I'm just not going to do this when it's my turn or okay, I know you're, I know, for example, my brother, he would do different things. And he's like, you know, I try to tell mom and dad, I'm going to work on this project and that project. And they're buzzkills. He's like, every time I tell them anything, it's a buzzkill. I looked at him, I'm like, why do you tell them? You know, they're going to, they, unless you tell them you got a really nice, solid nine to five job working in some company, because that's what they understand. Anything you go to them with, they're going to kill it. So you know what you do? You stop sharing. You have to know your audience. Instead of making them fit into what you want them to be, how about, I'm going to go back to the word, you accept them as they are, and then you navigate around that. 
but it's such a personal decision. And I think nobody can tell you how to, how to mind that field. You have to decide for yourself. And just to be clear, we're talking about family here. If this was not family, you'd probably be, you protect your, your energy for the life of you, right? Look, sometimes though it's, it can be family. Sometimes it's a, it's a boss. Mm. What do you do if it's your boss? You got to mind that field too, unless you can find another job that I've had those. I've had those. It's a great point. Uh, I've had those I've had in people, family tends to be the most that I hear about, but I also get boss, supervisor, or a colleague. That, and there are times where I'll say to them, let's manage them this way. And there are times where I say, this person's going to treat you this way, no matter what technique, skill, strategy I teach you, because they've gotten used to seeing you and treating you this way. There's no way to rectify this. Why don't you look for another place to go? So it's both. So it can be bosses or supervisors. I've had my fair share. Even in the Secret Service, we had those moments where I'm like, ah, how did you end up being my boss? But, you know, I had to deal with it. I had to deal with it. There was no uh, complaint form there. It's just like you had to suck it up. But, you know, you have to choose like, okay, well, how long can I take this for? To what degree? And if it's that painful, it's like, just go somewhere else. Like you, you still have a choice. You're not stuck there. You could choose to be stuck there, but you never really stuck there. Right. I don't know. Am I answering your question, Craig, or did I go yeah. like way? No, you, I was actually thinking of like friends, like from your past that you kind of outgrow. Cause I know you talk often about like evolving from relationships, but I didn't even think about the wild card that could be someone's boss. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because that's probably interesting to navigate as well. In addition to immediate family. Well, how do you, like, can I ask you a question? I would think with all the changes you've made, yeah. what did you do with your friends? What happened to you? I love that you put me on the spot. The yeah, I want to know. I'm I'm truly curious. I want to know. The truth is, is I don't have much in common with the people that Craig 1.0 used to attract. And, and I just want to be clear, doesn't mean I'm better than them. I just, I'm going down a different path and, and I'm more aligned with you and people on my, since I reinvented myself journey. And so the distance between text messages maybe is a little bit longer. The interactions are a little bit shorter. Uh, and I spent a lot less time with them, if I'm being honest. I don't think there's anything wrong with that because it's you become who you surround yourself with. When I, you know, when I do consulting or I work with people, one of the questions I ask them is I say to them, who are the five people you have the most daily contact with? Daily. Not who you feel close to or anything like that. Daily. Because no matter how strong our self-identity is, Craig, myself included, I will become what I'm around. So if I want to soar, if people around me are not soaring, I'm not going to soar. I'm not going to fly high. You know, e even when I go back to the the simplicity of the U.S. Secret Service and people always, people come to me like civilians and say, you'd really take a bullet for this person. That's weird. I would never do that. And why would you ever do that? And then when you go into the service and if you ask that question, everybody in there is like, yeah, take a bullet. Why wouldn't I take a bullet? No better way to die than saving another human being's life. So I agree with you and I, yes, like if you have so much, you have a finite amount of energy and time. And so you do have to delegate where that energy and time goes yes. and who are the people you want to attract and be around. And I do remember when I went into the NYPD, um, having grown up in Queens and New York and being born in Harlem and being around, you know, tough environments. I had to distance myself from a lot of um, friends because one, I couldn't be friends with them if I was in law enforcement, full, full exposure. And then they just couldn't grasp or understand, you know, what I was doing with my life. And I couldn't be around that because it wasn't good for my confidence, you know, or, you know, it wasn't, good. it just wasn't good. And, you know, a lot of my friends became either stay at home moms or teachers Nothing's wrong with either one. That's okay, right. But was interesting, I didn't judge them for that, but I was judged for my choices as the anomaly or oddball or weird or she's strange or, and um, even though I in some ways, some of those relationships I tried, I was like, this isn't good for me. I can't be around people who, who, who make me feel bad about my choices in life. If I know I'm making good choices for myself 
I know I'm not hurting anybody. And I, I, I let go for, for some people, for a lot of people. And See? I also understand the person can only do so much in my life. And I, I just don't know if that's what I need. And let's just be honest, like people are in our life, most likely for a season and a reason, right? And once you accept that, then you realize like no one has a whole pass forever, unless it's your immediate family. But even them, like, you know, be selective with the interactions and so forth. You, that's a really good point, because often people think because they've known somebody since they were a kid, oh, but this is my childhood friend. That's great. And maybe they were great for you when they were your childhood friend. But what is that relationship now? And this goes back to what is the truth of the reality now? Are they happy for you? Do they support you? Are they positive? Or are they jealous of you or envious of you? Or do they put you down? Or do they use you? Or what do the dynamics of that relationship look like? Or do they do nothing with their life and just sit and watch Netflix all day and eat nacho chips? Nothing wrong with that. But maybe that's not my path. Read. That's okay for them, but I can't do that. No. Yeah. So just because they they were with us from the beginning, it doesn't always mean they have to stay with us throughout the whole way through. It's it's what you're doing, Craig, and I 100% agree with it. You should constantly be assessing, and I do this as well, who's around me, who has access to me, how much access they have to me, and are they elevating my, I want to say my soul. Because it's not my resume, my business. It's my, are they elevating me? Yes. Or are they stifling me? And if they're stifling me and I choose to hang with them, then that is on me. It's great to do an audit or a spiritual purge, whatever you want to call it. But take an assessment of who you're giving yourself access to in your orbit. And it's pretty simple, right? If they're not, if you don't leave an interaction with them most of the time elevated, it's time to reconsider. Or if you're hanging out with people or someone, you hang out with someone and after you're done, you're like, man, I need a nap. Yeah. That's a red flag. Same. Yep. You nailed it. Yes. Relationships should be, I, I, I use this analogy a lot, like tennis. It's like a tennis match. You hit the ball, they hit the ball. You hit the ball, they hit the ball. That's balance. But if it's just you hitting the ball all the time, that's not balance. That's not good. You have the best analogies. <laughs> a lot of practice, a lot of failures, you know, or failings rather, because I'm not a failure, failings in life and a lot of learning lessons. And, you know, I can sit and look at these situations and say, why me? Why this? Why that? And I look at it as a learning lessons and a journey and it not, I'm not looking for bliss. I'm not looking for perfection and I'm not looking for happiness because happiness is such a overrated. I don't even know what that means. Same. I need to live. I just want to live my life the best I can. You're amazing. So Donna, this is honestly one of the best conversations I've ever had. It, it literally was all over the map in the best. Oh, I'm sorry, Craig. <laughs> oh, this is the best. And we're going to bring you on for a sequel anyway. Only negative I got going on is we don't have 10 hours to chat, but I think it's just the beginning of the friendship. I say very humbly, the audience, the community is breaking out. We're about 5 million now. What's the best way for all of them to support you? Come find me. Come find me. I'm at evypompuras.com, E-V-Y-P-O-U-M-P-O-U-R-A-S. And, you know, my book, Becoming Bulletproof, is out there. You can get it on Audible. You can get it, order it, a hard copy from Amazon. It's done. It's been published in many languages across the world. And if you're just looking just to up-level, just change things, shift perspective, and just want to feel more like you're owning your existence, I encourage you, it's really going to help you make that transition. Love it. Hang up for one second. I'm going to connect with you after. Evie, I want you to know you the definition of perspective, authenticity, and emotional intelligence. I could personally guarantee your best yet to come. Keep on spreading your wings and leaving your mark on this world. So much love and respect for you. Thank you so much for stopping by and dropping these priceless, juicy nuggets today. Thank you so much, Craig. I mean, you're amazing. I don't think I could have had any more fun. Oh, awesome. Sorry. Like, I, I feel, I hope I didn't take you like too many. Oh, that was the, aren't those the best though? When it's just like, like a tennis match. Yes. You know what we just had? And it's a whole other thing in communication. This is called rapport. I'm familiar. NLP. Yeah. Rapport. rapport. So, uh, I, rapport. So I go, you go. I go, you go. I go, you go. That's yeah. rapport. 
Uh, yeah. 100%. I'm big. Hey. I'm big on that as well. And I know you obviously have a great background in that. So uh, this was awesome. Let's stay connected. Yes, absolutely. Anytime you reach out, I'm in New York. So thank you again for having me. And again, a huge sorry for last time. All good. Evie, do you ever come into the city? Yeah, all the time. I'd love to grab a cup of coffee or something. If we can make it work yes. with schedules. Yes, yes. Why don't we try? Can we exchange we... numbers? Yes, yes. Do you have Go your ahead. phone? I'll give you mine. Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to write it down and I'm going to send you a text. What's your number, Craig? 